Hi everyone, welcome to the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I am the invisible host inside your head. Once again, invisible. Last time we were here together, uh, I was not. You saw me and you saw Liam, the lovely cat who is sometimes going to yell on this stream today. Um, but we are here on the GDC Twitch channel doing what we usually do, which is talking to game developers about the cool games that they are working on. Today, we are playing uh, The Blackout Club. The Blackout Cub Club comes from the folks at Question, who were previously released the Magic Circle. And in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, I'll give, jo I'll give Jordan a little more FaceTime down there. Um, uh, Jordan, we have, yeah, just pulling Jordan over. Yeah, well then Mike loses out. Oh no, I have to pick. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Jordan. You can you can totally favor. It's good. It's it's a Bioshock style uh, harvest save situation. Oh, it's harvest save. It's Bioshock. I guess we'll talk about Bioshock today since you all worked on. It. Anyway, uh, this is Jordan and Michael. Jordan has the red background behind him. Say hi, Jordan. Hello. And that's Michael. He's got the nice headset on. Hello. Um, and they will be taking your questions today. Um, basically, uh, the Blackout Club is a four-person horror co-op game, which you are seeing. Um, we are playing the demo level. Uh, Feral Disclosure this is, is pre-recorded footage, so you can't yell at me if I'm messing up. You can only just reflect on the errors I have made. Um, so we're going to go through the demo level, and then before we're out today, we will get to see a couple full missions of the game, because I did was able to find some very nice people to play with last night who were very helpful and very kind. you got a nice community. Oh, uh, that's very good to hear. We're very proud of uh, our Discord community, especially right now. Yeah, I, I admit it wasn't through. I just found them in the lobbies. Anyway, um, I guess to get honestly, it's probably mostly the same people. <laughs> to get, uh, I guess I'm looking at this high five machine first. Um, well, as I awkwardly high five uh, the robot, um, Jordan and Michael, would you mind explaining the origins of the Blackout Club and why you went from making a game like the Magic Circle to making a four person horror co op game? I think we should make Patches explain this. I would love to hear your take on why that probably was. For the record, Michael is Patches, although I still don't know. Oh, we lost Patches' cam Patches camera. Never mind. I'll do that then. Yeah, so um, following the Magic Circle, which is an extremely meta game about game development, yeah. um, we had sort of our fill of two things. One, games that say exactly what they mean. Um, mm -hmm. It was fun, but we've done that for a very long time uh, through several Bioshocks and then the Magic Circle. And then secondarily, the sort of length problem, um, the major criticism of the Magic Circle from most people who bought it was this game is too short, right? I, I paid for this much. I want a game that goes on for much longer. Okay. And the world is changing. Steam is changing. We need something that we personally believe in, which is the sort of cooperative horror thing, but that dovetails better with the way people play games on Steam, which is getting involved with them and sticking with them over a longer period. Yeah. And so I pitched around um, a couple of different things, and the one that stuck uh, was this notion of a, a suburban horror game where uh, the friendship between these sort of, the set of kids was going to be uh, at center stage, and that you would be scared, but with friends. Uh, and we were three people at the time. We've doubled in size since. We brought on Michael Patches Kelly here, uh, who is now back, and uh, uh, several others, and we began to sort of bolt it together. We're now in early access, as you know, and uh, finally starting to get real feedback from people on how it feels to play and improving it every day. Right on. Uh, Patches, before you quickly dropped out there, um, uh, Jordan said he wants to hear your version of your origin story for Black Hawk Club, so... I want to hear it too. What what's your what's your take? Uh yeah, sorry about that. Um my internet is wonderful quality. Um so uh let me think about the actual origin of it. Uh when I started working at Question, uh Jordan had told me that they were working on, you know, we were trying to find a way to do a new horror game that was going to solve our publishing problem as just a small game dev mm -hmm. uh you probably did answer so i kind of caught the tail end of jordan's answer so uh, apologies if i overlap but um you know if you're a small game dev you're trying to make a game that it plays to our strengths right like we worked on AAA games steven and jordan worked on bioshock you know kane came from dishonored so the sort of first person immersive sim genre is something we really like obviously i like working on those games and playing them as well so um we were gonna do that except for the idea was jordan wanted to return to horror um because that's sort of his strength um 
you know, from the Fort Frolic level and, and Shellbridge Cradle and things like that. From so, Bioshock. Um, yeah, so, so a Fort Frolic's uh, mission in the original Bioshock, and then Shellbridge Cradle was a level in Thief 3, uh, Deadly Shadows, uh, which is also very scary. Um, so Jordan does a good scary level. Um, if you have played this mission that uh, we're watching footage of right now, um, you would be surprised that as a, as a player, um, this actually gets pretty scary. We've had people, yeah. you know, <laughs> writing us on, on Steam community and on forums basically saying, you know, this I couldn't get through the intro and what looks like just walking around a house at night um, can still be can still be scary in the right hands. And so, um, you know, I felt pretty confident joining question that Jordan had the right hands to make more scary experiences and I wanted to help him with that. Um, so that was kind of the origin of what became the blackout club originally we had the, to solve the publishing problem of typically what happens is you're a small game developer you make a game it's you know you can only make so many hours of single player content before you run out of money and time and then what tends to happen is people play it and then they're done and that's the end of your sort of community that's the end of sort of you know attention on the game as well as you know, a lot of people will just put it on Twitch and then they'll just watch somebody play through it. And it's not that uh, we don't want people to enjoy the content, but it's harder to get the sale. Um, you know, being honest, uh, it's it's hard to make a living. And so, you know, multiplayer was something we knew could bring people back in, but there's a real problem with horror and multiplayer um, that probably anybody ask or who plays games like this could tell you, which is, you know, the more friends you add to the scenario, the less scary and, and usually more absurd it becomes. Yeah. Um, so what worked for us when we were developing the Blackout Club was we can lean into that because they're teenagers. Um, typically what happened, like, I'm a, I'm a coward. I'm a scaredy cat. I don't like playing horror games uh, by myself alone in the dark. And uh, I do it because it's the best experience, but I always, you know, scare myself. Um, and so I typically like going back to like Resident Evil games and stuff like that back in the day tend, I tend to play like over the weekend with a friend on the couch and we trade the controller or something. So that playing a scary game with your friends experience is something we thought like, okay, here's something we can lean into. It's a little bit of a better, I'm maybe the, I'm telling you too much sales information, but this is, you know, the GDC Gama Sutra. So I feel yeah. like, uh, you want to hear this, uh, we do, we do. you know, yeah, we were like, how do we. How do we make this something that you can actually, uh, you know, it's a bigger audience, right? It's a, there's the horror audience, but then there's the friends of the horror audience that you're bringing in. And it's like, well, we'll, you know, I, I like watching my friend play a scary game, but usually I'm too much of a coward myself. But if we're both playing and we're having some fun in the way that you would with like Left 4 Dead or Vermintide or any other sort of like co-op game, um, then I've got something to do, and you're here with me, and so we're brave together. Um, uh, really and... quick, this fucking tree, this tree scared me so much <laughs> that we just saw a couple minutes ago. Yeah, that one. Yeah, tell me this more. I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Michael, do you have anything else you want to add? Well, that's uh, so anyways, long story short, that's, that's kind of how we got there was the idea, like how do we do a multiplayer co-op horror game and being teenagers in this scenario, we knew that there's a lot of potential for great horror because, you know, the genre tells us that, but um, Teens vs. Monsters is, is full of lots of great stuff we love and wanted to pay tribute to, and we can talk about that later, but yeah, um, yeah anyway, so that's that was the origin of from a gameplay standpoint, we were trying to find, like, let's take that horror experience, but like, let's find a way to get your friends involved. And then looking around at other popular multiplayer cooperative games, if we do it as cooperative, we're in this together against the scary thing. Um, we felt like that was a good, you know, a good game, a good premise. And we think it'd be something people would want to play, but also you can't spoil it as much if people are streaming it. Um, because the magic is is your experience with your friends, right? Right. That's what's fun about it. And I guess um, on the streaming end, there's also the argument that like if if people aren't playing, they're watching other people play. It's like watching a horror movie. It's like watching people be trapped in a horror movie making dumb decisions, which is what right. you will see plenty of times in the stream, because you're you get to watch me making terrible decisions in a horror movie. Um, uh, if I can if I can mo ask about both of you about what happened after that first decision sort of that cognizance that you wanted to make a horror game and you also want to make a game that could retain a community um what was the first uh architectural and design thing you had to do 
to to take that very loose, very I'm sure very like not it, it's not exactly I mean you could say it's Left for Dead but with tit kids and then build that out. But I'm sure it wasn't quite like that when you were building it. How did you go from sort of those fundamental roots of game of game business and game design to making what we're looking at right now? Well, it was a combination. The, the first task uh, was to switch from Unity to Unreal. Mm -hmm. um, Unreal has a built-in multiplayer architecture, which was a lot more robust and was, uh, got us up and running much more swiftly. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, the game um, pitch was that you would be underground the entire time, uh, trapped alone in the maze beneath the streets. Uh, spoiler alert, there's a maze beneath the streets. We'll see. And uh, you were... Um, you would band together with people, but in a sort of more journey-esque uh, mm -hmm. format where your, your sessions would merge and then, and then part kind of seamlessly. It was interesting, but uh, we transitioned pretty early on to a session-based model where um, you're able to actually experience the kids' neighborhood in suburbia, and, uh, and then we weren't bound by the rules of a persistent world like we would be in something like Bioshock. Yeah, uh, and so changing towards that made us more Left 4 Dead like, um, and honestly, to some extent, those earmarks that people learn to look for, like I like games like this. We needed a few of them, and we were willing to say, like, okay, yeah, let's let's, let's be as familiar as possible from the surface, uh, and then surprise them once they're in. Um, and so we developed a sort of world bible it was uh, by now very far out of date uh we developed a series of mission pitches uh, also uh, super long in the tooth now and not highly relevant but they got us off the ground mm -hmm. and um we began to hire and so we we brought on on patches uh, uh jason mojica from the payday 2 team um jeff lake from dishonored and uh, uh prey um and david Pittman, who had done eldritch uh yeah. and worked with us on bioshock 2 and um, we're also working with Patrick Balthrop, who did audio for uh, multiple Bioshocks and um, many others. <laughs> and uh, in any case, we're now actually seven. Um, uh, but long story short, it became a process of trying to make sure the vision made sense each time a new person came on. The hiring sort of forced us to reframe what the hell the thing was um, as uh, each time somebody new would come in and say like, okay, well, what, what is it you want me to do? Um, and it, it has been a fast growth process. It has been challenging. Uh, we've also had help. Um, we can't really talk about from where, but suffice it to say, um, there are people who believed in us and helped make the Blackout Club happen. And honestly, it wouldn't have without them. Um, and so it was a combination of working with them from afar and also building our own team that has, I think, been our primary challenge. The actual game, um, you know, there are a lot of creative challenges, but uh, suburban horror, uh, the sort of teens versus the truth monster genre is something that everybody's got their favorite um, yeah. uh, from pop culture in their head. We, we felt like it was something that, that people would be able to drop into easily so we can be as weird as we want, but you can always fall back on, well, I basically know what I'm doing. Uh, that was a long answer to your question. No, it's a good answer. Uh, Michael, do you want to add anything? Yeah, you're gonna have to repeat the question though. Uh, at this point, <laughs> moving. I, I followed. I followed Jordan's ride, but I didn't know. Uh, I forgot where we started. <laughs> you, you don't know what train station we started at. Um, what was what was your experience moving this game from idea to execution? Uh, so when I first came on the project, um, we, you know, the, so I came from a production background. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I was an EP on the Bio games uh, and Top Spin and a bunch of other games at 2K. Uh, it was in my old life, and then I did mobile games for a while. And so when I came, before I joined Question, and uh, so when I came on, you know, my first instinct is, okay, we need a roadmap, we need a plan, we need a skeleton. You know, how what's how are we going to allocate our our money and time and budget and all that stuff? So. Um, that was the first thing we did and we uh, I you know this was also an opportunity to sort of test you know when you're an AP coming out in production land you know it, it, you are not making any decisions you're just enforcing other people's decisions so I had tried early on to try and say like well I've always wanted to and believe very strongly that like a small playable prototype is the best money we could spend you know do n don't worry about it being pretty just make it fun and we called it ugly but fun um and this isn't just my idea like uh, the, the team is very uh i would say you know jordan correct me if i'm wrong but i'd say a very flat structure you know everybody really does have a say we're small enough that it's just not worth it to try to impose much of a hierarchy other than 
obviously I'm not going to do the art that Stephen is good at that. You know, I'm not writing C++, but um, in general, we sort of hashed out, okay, what would be like a core experience? What are the things we know we have to have? And so, and it takes a while to get up and running. I mean, you know, we switched over to Unreal. We weren't in Unity anymore. All of the code had to be more or less started over from scratch. Um, and so, you know, it's like, okay, let's make sure, and locomotion takes a long time, you know, even in Unreal, just to get it exactly the way you want. We knew we wanted to do, you know, this kind of combat where you're getting up close with people. We knew we wanted to have a closed eyes mechanic for the shape. I think that was a pretty early concept in this game's development um, and still stays pretty core to the identity of the game. You know, um, an enemy that you can only see with your eyes requires, you know, some engine modifications. <laughs> it's not just, uh, you know, those tricks. And so we kind of did that. And then the lastly, the recording mechanic, I think was another big one. Uh, we worked on pretty early which was you know you're gonna have this phone in your hand that phone actually shows you you know a screen capture of what you're looking at you can see it there in the bottom on the left uh, mm -hmm. the record screen capture and then we had gone through and then iterate you know like figure out what's fun about this so because the idea is you know one thing but actually making it fun is game development so uh that was kind of our first six months, I'd say, maybe a little longer, was really just prototyping, prototyping, prototyping. We had a little map, Jordan Gray boxed, uh, you know, we did a bunch of art tests, and then it was, okay, let's, you know, get, you know, we, coming from uh, Unity the last couple years, you know, uh, the question team had to sort of change the mentality to get back over to Unreal, because it's just a different way of working. Mm -hmm. um, getting Perfor set up, just kind of all the nuts and bolts stuff that you do starting a project was my first six months or so on the project. Um, and then, yeah, uh, once we felt pretty good about the prototype, uh, you know, we changed a lot of things in the core design because we were like, oh, this is more fun. That other thing didn't work. Um, what are you and talking then, about? It was perfect. It was perfect. <laughs> From the word go. <laughs> yeah, we've never changed our minds. Um, and so... We changed our minds a lot. We worked on a bunch of different ideas, but the the primitive, the reason you don't put a lot of high quality art in yet and really dive in on even sound design and things um, first was because you know you want to be sure that the game is a game that you want to play for a long period of time. And so we had some other ideas that we wanted to add later. Um, you know, the procedural mission stuff didn't come on immediately. We had to sort of determine what makes a mission. You know, what does it mean? It's just dumb stuff. Like, what is an objective? Okay, it's, a, you know, like you have to kind of deconstruct games and put it all together. So we did that. Um, we felt pretty good about the prototype. And then, uh, you know, you, you flesh out, okay, what is the minimum viable product? What's an MVP? People call that like a vertical slice or a horizontal slice or some slice. Um, what are the features we know we want to have and then what is the stuff that you know adding on top of it will make it better and you sort of prioritize your work from there like what is the stuff you know you can't not deliver I just realized that um, orb in the middle freaked me out a lot more this time watching <laughs> my own footage than it did the first time I saw it um, uh, anyway so that's yeah that was that was how we got started right on uh, MPKNT in chat would like to clarify uh, AP stands for associate producer right that's correct yeah cool. Um, um, it could be assistant producer places too. You know, it's not yeah. the main producer. Yeah. Um, how does the testing? They would also like to know how does the testing and iteration process go for a game like this compared to the single player games you all are more familiar with? Uh, it's a lot harder. Um, you know, we are a small team. Uh, getting four player multiplayer means you know more than fifty percent of the team needs to be testing at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, which you know normally you don't. Normally it's you know you everybody has their own. Like at a large AAA scenario, you'd have a dedicated on-site QA team. You'd have an off-site QA team. You'd have them embedded with a designer or an engineer working together mm -hmm. um, with a clear test plan. We're our own QA for a lot of it. We do have an outsourced contractor we used, um, uh, you know, especially to help just kind of nuts and bolts functional QA or format QA. Um, are terms you probably heard of, but it's just the, you know, can I clip through the wall? What happens if I jump off the ledge? You know, just normal testing does this feature do what it says on the 10 um so our our test process in general is you know kind of evolved over time but in general we all play the game as much as we can all the time um you test a lot in editor before you check in work 
and uh, and we have to sort of rely on the fact that everybody's pretty experienced. You know, this isn't anybody's first game. Um, so we, you know, we do test. Uh, but I will say, you know, being small, it means that we can't test as much as we need to to ship the game. And so we've also done, you know, a lot of internal friends and family testing and then mm -hmm. beta tests for pretty much from July through the end of October um, this year. And then, uh, in, you know, in October our, uh, we came out. That's where our Discord community was was built through a series of closed betas that patches ran very well and and uh, they were just instrumental mm -hmm. in uh, teaching us what was wrong with the game and what we needed to improve before early access. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people you might have met online are probably coming from that that original community, which has been wonderful. I mean, the the fact that people would have played our game, you know, at this point, dozens and dozens of hours well before it's done is, you know, awesome. Um, and that's that's turned into a lot of our sort of early access um, community as well to sort of help on ramp people because you probably know this, but you know for your listeners, tutorials are one of the last things you add in a game. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same. It goes back to that ugly but fun prototype mentality. You know, like don't spend a lot of effort on something you're going to throw away and rework um, because you know things change. So the last thing you want to put in is here's how it works. Um, so as a result, our early access is out, and it's not everything is tutorialized. You know, this prologue mission you're watching does a really good job, I would say, but it's not perfect. It doesn't have everything it needs, and you know, certainly there are a lot of concepts in this game that are, you know, we we started with the idea of like a first player, you know, stealth immersive sim type game, but once you add cooperative, once you add a mission based structure with sessions, once you add multiplayer plus a lot of other weird ideas we have in this game that kind of make it unique. You know, there's just a lot to teach. And uh, so it's been nice having a community that did play through the beta test because they can kind of help on ramp new players that we don't necessarily have the bandwidth to do. You get to what now you get to watch my, some of my struggles right here with um, not, not the art of not being heard. Um, uh -huh. Jordan, I'm going to, while I'm struggling with the dark forces uh, in this, um, I'm going to ask a question for you. Um, what was your thought process like teens versus the unknown seems like it has a very clear footing obviously um, what was your thought process for making this horror like like this undermining like horror cult like thing that's going on um, and kind of there's also the sense that like the parents are in on it um, there's sort of some implication that happens here at the end of the stream that like like it's 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 almost like the entire town is like engaged in this weird like mysterious stuff you're seeing um and how did that influence you know making things creepy and scary for players at a granular design level um oh let's see that's a that's a multifaceted one uh i guess i was really interested in building um a a kind of horror that worked on at least two levels, a kind of primal level. Uh, I think when you're an adolescent in particular, your mind is bring, being broken and reforging itself in real time. Uh -huh. And so you are constantly questioning your reality because it's important for your previous model of reality to blow up in order for you to sort of slowly grow up, right? Yeah. So things like, um, what if my family is tr is out to get me? What if my, my dad is actually evil? Like that kind of stuff um, floats through the average kid's brain as they as they grow older. And so it seemed like a, a, a sort of ripe age to talk about um, learning that in fact you are at the heart of a, um, a grand lie of some kind, right? And yeah. that your own family could turn against you. I feel like everybody can understand that on a visceral level, whether or not they understand any of what... Uh, the team mocked me by calling the deep lore. And <laughs> on the other end of that spectrum, um, I wanted to build a, a kind of mythology that didn't resemble anything else. Um, yeah. that, that when you got into the maze under Red Acre, uh, Virginia, here in the uh, National Radio Quiet Zone, where there's no kind of internet signal, no, no cellular access, you would see something that could plausibly exist in the modern world, but made you think of some timeless era uh, that you were suddenly dipping uh, your, uh, your toe into without understanding it. Um, and so, you know, people flo float around words, words like cult, but I hope that as they play, they, they become kind of versed in something even stranger than that. Um, and uh, I don't want to go deep into spoilers, but uh, I, the game states very little of what it means relative to something like the Magic Circle or Bioshock, because we want that part of your brain to constantly be grappling with 
that that fuzzy unknown edge uh, outside of the edge of, uh, edge of consciousness, and and it is it should feel like a nightmare, but a nightmare that operates by a a strong inner logic, and we hope that our players slowly puzzle that out. Right on. Um, I think kind of building on that is um, what was it's the the teenager element is interesting to me because the the teens are very not good at what most video game characters are good at. Like they're not good at fighting. <laughs> They have they can grab and pin, which Doctor Thoss and Chat uh, says they're a big fan of that mechanic, um, uh, but they can't um, they can't you know shoot monsters. This isn't Left for Dead shooting zombies. Uh, they're they're sort of they're they're really good at grappling hooks, which is probably something I wasn't good at when I was a teen. Um, but uh, how did you design individual interactions that you think fit the th that were both like thematic and good gameplay, and also like wouldn't make patches over here look at you in horror when you pitched it to him oh it's uh another good question with many answers and i will try to keep them concise um we had a, a few creative pillars of the game um uh, and i won't go into all of them but one of them was that movement was a reward uh, yeah. intrinsically um a sort of uh, kind of viscerally satisfying um and Kane Shin, uh, our sort of technology lead, uh, who joined us late on the Magic Circle and then sort of saved us, frankly, um, is is big into that. He plays lots of games where movement matters, and so he kind of made it his personal baby. And I think that he's executed on it beautifully. That, that, that these kids are way better at parkour than I will ever be. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, with that established, we knew that we could say, okay, well, that means that combat is not going to be a thing. Grappling will be a panicky and uh, Pyrrhic victory at best. If you get away from somebody, it's going to hurt um, unless you use an escape item, in which case that still has a cost. And so uh, we wanted to focus on the idea that uh, horror is at its best when um, vulnerability is maintained, right? And so we spoke to an age that seemed reasonably vulnerable and that allowed us to unask questions about why don't I just fight back? Why don't I just use martial arts and, and uh, defeat all of these adults one by one like you would in thousands of other games? Uh, and so it was hard to say no to ourselves for a long time. Um, we have met, made many games where combat was a main feature, but we felt like between the sort of guerrilla tactics, the, the kind of clever outwit your enemies tactics that, that began to develop through the other systems the player has access to, and that movement, um, we could sell to the player the idea that you can either be very stealthy in this game, because we've built those before, or you can be loud as long as you keep moving. Um, and in no case are you going to stand in place and defeat all of your enemies. You have to move on, get your mission done, take some footage of something forbidden, and then flee. Um, uh, speaking to that that heart of, of horror in your hometown. Um, and all of those, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, um, are uh, are willing to handshake with the fact that we have strong constraints as a, at a team our size. It is mm -hmm. best for us to control our scope through uh, various creative choices that don't necessarily cripple the experience. I didn't keep that short, but you get the idea. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, short answers are not a... Uh, as, as someone who asks long questions, I probably earn long answers. Um, uh, if you hear some meowing in the background, that is not the Blackout Club, that is Liam returning to us and making his presence known. He's glaring at me right now because I won't pay attention to him. He's on the other side of the room yelling at me. Um, uh, Liam's Good. a cat. I want, I want to add uh, animals to the game, but that is another thing that we had to say no to ourselves about for a while. Aww. Yeah. I hope yeah. cos cosmetic pets would be good. Yeah, as right. long, yeah, as long as it doesn't need like a skeletal mesh with rigging and AI, then sure. Yeah, as long as it doesn't need to appear alive. If it's a prop, yeah, no problem. <laughs> just a cat that it just it's like a cat model that just follows you around. Yeah. Uh, well, let's not get crazy with the following around. Yeah. It was pathfinding. <laughs> That's it's a ghost. Like, it's a ghost cat. It clips through everything. Basically, Old G man along. My my reaction to your joke proposal for uh, just adding a cat is basically my reaction to everything anybody proposes all the time on this game, uh, which is usually like, nope, we're a small team. Nope, we're a small team. Uh, so it's a good instinct that has gotten us uh, still plenty of features. I I will let Liam <laughs> know that his request for a playable cat has been denied. Um, yeah. Back to serious questions. Just a quick reminder for folks in chat. You can ask your own questions of uh, our guests so that you can learn more about the making of the Blackout Club. Um, 
Uh, let's talk about early access. Um, and what's cool is in a minute here we're gonna get to see the um, uh, we're gonna get to see the multiplayer stuff after I'm done with this bit. Um, uh, let's talk about early access. Um, how is it going for you all? Like early access is complicated because it's pitched as you know a chance to test your game before you can make it. Um, in reality, for some devs, it is their first and only launch. And then if they are if they play it right, they'll get a second launch when they go. Um, what has been your sort of your uh, guiding light through uh, Steam's dark waters, I suppose. That metaphor was darker than I intended it to be, but that's the game we're playing, isn't it? Uh, dude, I can take this one. So, uh, you know, I did not do the early... Like, the Magic Circle did come out on early access. Um, I was not on that project, but that was largely, like, a, you know, used for, hey, the, the game really is coming out just in, a, in an extra week or two. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I think that was a really good strategy that they did. Um, but this time, you know, it kind of feeds into my earlier point of uh, the reply about QA. Mm-hmm. You know, we need we need people playing the game uh, to know a lot of things. You know, like how is the economy working? You know, if you've got a weird computer we haven't tested compatibility on yet, you know, we can afford only so much you know, PC compatibility lab testing time where somebody with, you know, 20 different rigs tries your game and, you know, gives you frame cap and things like that, you know. uh, There's so much that we just, being a multiplayer game, can't test all of it. And so we we knew we had to do a long early access period. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, we did a long beta test, right? Like, we, we did beta test. We told people we were announcing this game you know, in, at the end of February, that it would be out in 2019. Uh, but by summer of 2018, you could already play it in a beta test. Yeah. Uh, if you were on a newsletter, um, and then you know, we slowly let in more rounds of people after that from both the newsletter sign up and then uh, eventually our Discord community. Yeah. Um, and you know, we had plenty of takers, which was you know, we're very fortunate that the idea was strong enough that a lot of people you know had were hyped enough to want to help test in beta test because i mean a beta is not a finished game um and you know some people it's difficult right because a game like fortnite is on season four of early access um yeah you know it kind of becomes meaningless for larger games that will never leave early access because why would they because they don't need to um and a lot of other games that we really enjoy i mean i'm not uh trashing that approach but um we knew that we at the end of the day still want to hit the date that we set out to do you know we still want to come out in 2019 we want to come out you know ideally early in 2019 and so early access is our best chance of pulling that off and it's because we need that qa attention we need a community to sort of vet a lot of design ideas we're trying that are certainly novel um and uh how the community sort of reacts to a lot of surprises we have in store for them i think is going to inform how ready the game is for full launch if that makes sense um but mainly it's just it you know it's the best way to actually do what early access was meant to do which is hey if you're excited about this game and you want to help its development and feedback on its development early access is wonderful you know my hope is that uh this will this will be a positive experience for us it's you know the first couple weeks have been pretty good um, we've got another update hopefully coming out at the end of this week um, before the holiday, the Thanksgiving holiday, um, for people to enjoy while we're out. And then uh, we did a week one update. You know, it, certainly a lot of prioritization of bugs came, has already come out of the early access from people who weren't in our beta but just picked up the game for the first time, aren't, you know, dozens of missions in and their first time user experience is very different than the beta testers were so you know i think the pick up and play nature of our game between you know day one and week one was pretty significant just in that first update and i think it's going to be pretty noticeable again with this week's update um we're trying to react pretty quick to that stuff and the, and the hope is right that people feel like we're not ditching them because um, there is that fear on early access. You come out, you hit early access, you say, here's an incomplete game, we'll totally get to finishing it, and then you don't. Um, we certainly intend to finish it. So that's the... Uh, that's Our hope is that early access, our, our 
you know long-term conversation with the community is not that long-term because there is a there is an actual you know you can see us trending towards full launch and then we hit full launch right on um we're about to hit the multiplayer part so jordan i'll have some questions for you based on my experience here first you can watch uh my character creation uh a uh, quick shout out. I was actually pretty impressed with this creator because it was a very simple tool that let me uh, be pretty, like, I could see how different people could express themselves in different ways in this thing in pretty important ways. Like, it's pretty easy to make a character who is uh, gender non-conforming or of different ethnicities uh, pretty easily. Um, yeah, we're trying to yeah. we're trying to sort of um, let you define what you want to look like with your eyes rather than with sort of labels. Yeah, although the, uh, as you, I tested this for a minute, the, the dark skin looked really dark. Um, yeah, yeah, it looks like your gamma is also pretty different. I think we need to be a little more aggressive with our, our gamma tuning. Anyway, um, uh, we are just looking, looking in chat, just some quick shout outs to, uh, Snaps the Bunny, um, uh, Veloxization and, uh, Kane Asylum. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, remember you can ask some questions of our... Uh, guests, Michael and Jordan, I, I assume some of you are uh, actual developers on this game, so I'm sure you can just yell at them in your own uh, time at the, whatever questions you have. Um, sorry, I cannot make this a team meeting um, as much as I would like to, but just eavesdrop on team meetings for this game. Um, yeah, moving snaps on. and Veloxization are two of our kind of star Discord people. Nice. Um, welcome. Uh, Jordan, I'm going to have some questions about horror design for you in a moment, but I just want to follow up with uh, with Mike on one question related to... Um, I'm curious, so it's really, like, I think a lot of devs, you know, are sort of uh, fear... Like, user acquisition is one of the giant biggest questions that everyone is talking about. How? So how did you get folks... How did you... What was your method for getting people to sign up for the beta and then early access? We are, you know, hashtag blessed in that uh, we have some name recognition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, question is, it's not our first game. Uh, we already had a newsletter for the Magic Circle. The company already had, you know, followers on social media. I can imagine it is that much harder if you can't say, hey, former Bioshock developers do X. Um, clearly, all of our old colleagues are doing the same trick. Mm -hmm. I, you know, wish them the best. I think it's the right move to make. Cause Shout out hard. to the Molasses Flood. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I just read a good what I think on on uh, their game anyway so um it's a user acquisition right now when we started was we have a newsletter we have a social media account some people follow those things you know uh, personal accounts also bring in followers uh, we were lucky in that you know again the the credentials of the studio brought people around we have a pr agency we work with um who did outreach as well to press so the usual stuff right um if you've if you've worked on indie games or if you've worked on triple a games the technique is still more or less the same right uh a pr agency or you is going to reach out to every outlet you can find and every possible you know journalist who might be interested in this you know try not to waste their time you have a press kit you say here are screenshots and images and you know uh, and basic information about the game. Here's how you can reach us if you have more questions. Uh, let the world know that we have you know an announced trailer, and the announced trailer we worked on for probably almost a month. Um, you know, in between normal work, but there was definitely at least a good work of no, really, this is an important part of getting people to pay attention to us um, to get that trailer done. And that was even you know Patrick Baltrop who does our audio. Uh, and also did some audio on Molasses Flood, um, did, uh, you know, a, a very cool treatment. I think if you listen to that teaser trailer announcement that we did, um, it's, it stands out, not just, uh, because of the great art and animation that Steven did, um, but also, you know, Patrick's work on, uh, on audio, I think kind of brings people in. So we had a good trailer. Um, we had some name recognition and that got us, you know, uh, a five digit number of newsletter signups mm -hmm. um, that was enough certainly to populate a beta test and then some um, so we had that uh, we got on steam as quick as possible so people could wish list us and then that gives you like a nice you know just speaking from a production standpoint you get like a nice snowball effect of just over time more people tell people you know they tell two friends and so you get like a trickle of wish lists coming in and then just any news announcement so you know we went to PAX uh, to try and get some news and coverage, but also the bit, I think the bigger benefit for us with PAX, you don't get quite as much news coverage 
as maybe I thought we would have gotten, but uh, you do get a lot of hands-on time with real players. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a big deal. Um, we got to hear that, him scream for the yeah, first time. Yeah, it's, it's validating, right? Yeah. You can, and they can ask the questions that we don't think of to ask ourselves. So, you know, it's a gauntlet. It's way too long an event. <laughs> it's like four and a half full days of just like nonstop, hey, have you heard of the Blackout Club? But you do get a lot of people who have now heard of the Blackout Club and want to ask you about it. And some of them, you know, we had people coming back four days just to play the same demo again. Um, that's really validating and goes a long way just to team morale, but also helping us hone the pitch and also, you know, people who then got beta keys and joined our beta test um, and got a T-shirt and hopefully are wearing it around and, you know, just kind of stuff like that that helps us find a little bit of real world validation and also gets the word out and you know you can say that you were at these shows and you can point to footage from the event you know we met nice influencers like jesse cox who came by um and said nice things and talked about us you know so we we met a lot of we made a lot of good contacts um in terms of user acquisition at the moment you know early access we did basically the same thing we do for announcement right we had a new trailer Mm-hmm. We had a new press release, um, that kind of stuff. I um, also think that the beta test during that time, you know, key giveaways was a way to get people interested. Um, and, uh, you know, because people are spreading the word and inviting their friends who may also not have paid attention to us yet. And it reminded people that we are a game that even though we're not coming out till next year, there's already something you can play now. So even though we weren't in early access yet, people could at least anticipate that we were a real product and not vaporware um which you know i've worked on that in the past too and it's at some point you need to finish the game um so we're doing a very nice show of proof that no really there's a game and you can play it um and so but with early access right now i mean our user acquisition strategy is pretty light um if i'm honest we want people playing the game during early access but we do want early access players and the distinction meaning in this case you know just a step above a beta tester we really do want people who expect a broken game that's totally not you know not done with content and and will be iterated on based on feedback from the community um and most players are not that um so we will be ramping up user acquisition later when we get closer to full launch to do like the normal you know launch rollout and we're pretty uh, so we, we're pretty critical with ourselves about that issue. Like mm-hmm. we we QA pretty aggressively internally, and we we don't want to release something that is unplayable or that won't let you get XP and level up your character or anything like that. Like broken in the sense of there are imbalanced things you can pull off or you can make an AI look silly, that kind of stuff. But we we try very hard to make sure that at the very least, the if you buy the game and play it right now. You're going to have an interesting experience and an experience that uh, has a loop that completes, um, but that you're going to, we welcome your feedback on how to make it better. And we have reacted to that already with our first update and our upcoming one as well. Yeah, but like pretty much, uh, pretty much the early access feedback has like really changed the priority of how fast we were going to roll out stuff because it was like, oh wow, this is an issue that people care about immediately. Let's kind of drop everything and get a little bit better support in for quality of life stuff you know it's the things that as devs you work on a game for two years you don't think about it and then you realize like wow our subtitles are really small (laughs) you know (laughs) nobody can read them right Uh, it's just little things but it adds up um jordan i'm gonna switch over just because we're halfway through like my successful run um oh yeah this is the great part i saw them i saw the shape and then ran yeah Uh, yeah that that was you were asking about about you know, designing for um, horror and multiplayer. One of the biggest things that we sort of said early on is that there would be almost no scripted jump scares. That, yeah. That if there were jump scares, they would be entirely emergent out of systems interacting. And so mm-hmm. the close eyes mechanics where you can see that you're closing your in-game eyes there for people who haven't played the game before um, and revealing this, this boogeyman figure. Um, the intent was that you would have a jump scare just simply out of what you didn't know, right? And where you physically were positioned. And you have mm-hmm. to close off this major channel of information, which is the world around you, to see this one thing, which is this invisible figure. Um, and we've had a lot of people yelp like crazy uh, uh, in a way that seems like another scripted game. But in this case, it, it's there's no two nights that go exactly alike. Yeah. Um, and all of that is, well, a lot of that... Um, 
not necessarily the shape's uh, uh, effect specifically, but that notion of dynamism is is down to uh, David Pittman working on the the uh, procedural mission system. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we're trying very hard to make it feel like a deck of cards where we shuffle, and you play a game with a blackout club, and you are dealt an interesting hand, and the next night you'll be dealt a different one. And so, if Patches, for example, or Jason implements a new mission, that's like a new card that we shuffle into the deck, and it will just sort of seamlessly make the experience more varied as we keep updating it. Sorry, I'm sure you had a different question, but well, I'm glad. Honestly, I'm, I'm glad you chimed in on that, just because that was important to to call out. Um, uh, yeah, the um, my my follow up question would be, um, uh, what is what makes a good mission? It felt like to me you're about to see me embark on a second mission, and it'll go horribly wrong. Like we were exploring a similar space, if not the same space, but we were trying to get to a different location. Um, what's sort of the underlying psychology behind like making a good procedural mission in this game? Oh, well, uh, that's something that we are certainly learning in real time. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Jason coming on the team has been just miraculous in that front, both in terms of just kind of altering the layout to allow for uh, more multiplayer style movement among players and more um, inroads to the same space, right? Where if a a mission suddenly calls for you to enter from the absolute opposite opposite end of the map, that same space now serves uh, all of those masters. Um, and uh, he, his advice coming off of Payday 2, I, I think has, has helped a, a lot. The biggest thing that we're noticing is that um, there is a very fine line between designing a mission that um, is simple enough to be instantly parsed by a player who's dropped into a session. They've never played the tutorial. They were invited to play on Steam by a friend. Uh, and so they, they just need to follow the crosshair and do the thing that the game says. And the other end of the spectrum, which is these very advanced players who want a range of expression, who mm-hmm. don't want to be told exactly what to do, who want to want to have to poke around in dark corners and get lost for a while. Um, and we have, you know, a certain bandwidth between uh, those extremes in the Blackout Club right now and we're constantly kind of trying to find the right balance. Um, we're even playing with with ideas for ways to handle uh, advanced difficulty sort of with organically within the experience whether we pull that off uh, you know TBD but um, the biggest thing has been clear um, uh, entry and exit conditions uh, that can easily hand off to one another so the way it works right now is there's a category like steel mm-hmm. and so the kids are are there to steal something and the description of the mission says okay we're going to take something back from the bad guys but then the the specific thing that you're asked to steal can be radically different mm-hmm. um and in this case it's evidence bags in this case it's evidence yeah. bags okay. but um when you finish the evidence bags mission it might might swap to a radically um a different different card in the deck to extend the metaphor where suddenly you're asked to steal this bizarre sort of wooden head that sings every time you move. So it's kind oh. of like T-Rex vision in Jurassic Park or something. Yeah. Like every every time you move, there's a problem. And so um, one player has to sort of be that person who does a burst of movement, stands still while the other person runs around and runs scout for them. It's like, okay, let's go this way. There's a there's a Lucid, which is one of our bad guys. Yeah. Uh, this, this direction, so follow me, because I can move without making noise. Um, and so coming back to the point of procedural, that objective would just link up under the broader category of steel. And mm-hmm. so it sort of feels generally like you're doing something that has a narrative frame around it, but that um, there's a certain amount of dynamism as to which objectives you're asked to do that night. And then the kids um, are told to go home and that, that objective is always the same. And exfiltration can often be one of the hardest parts. Um, so it is at the moment, you tend to be asked to do two things a night um, that may extend to three to four kind of shorter things that you might be asked to do in a row, all part of the same category. And we're actually adding new categories um, in the upcoming update um, as well. Uh, and the hope is that you get to know the Blackout Club and the kinds of things they might do through the the uh, broader kind of um, buckets that those those categories represent. Mm-hmm. But then inside the bucket are, you know, different sort of collections of fun uh, uh, valuables and uh, each night you, you you come home with a different one um, and uh, right now um, our biggest burden is content we want a lot more mission types a lot more um, scenarios and, and little um, enemy behaviors things like that and uh, we will slowly let them creep into the build uh, and hopefully take early access players by surprise um, Dr. Thaw says Shape Boy is going to be here before we're even in the maze. Rip. Uh, yeah, this one doesn't go so well. Um, God, this moment when that when that 
when this jerk run, jumped through that window, I I was very unpleased. Um, uh, I I have yeah, the, a... the going through windows stuff was a lot was a lot of work. Uh, you know, props to Kane who is I think in that chat right now. Yeah. Uh, for the windows and a lot just our general mantle movement set overall. Um, I think went a long way. Really quick. Um, so what's interesting about this is um dying is complicated in the Blackout Club. You don't just get dinged and all your health goes down. You're done. You can see my poor friend there over on the left who um has the 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 face above their head and then. Um, that's what happens when you're, uh, sort of taken out. Obviously you can be dragged before a door and exposed to the shape, which turns you into that. Um, but during all that way, there's a way during all that time, there's a way for your friends to get you back in the game by tagging you and pulling you, you know, back to life. Um, you can see us try that later. It's going to go badly. This, this run goes badly. Um, uh, what was the mindset behind that? And even though horror is supposed to, you know, be about the threat of death, why was it so essential for you to give players a lot of ways to get back in control before dying? It's a combination. Um, because uh, once you have fully failed, there's a certain loss of your time investment. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, you have to restart. And because you might have been asked to do several procedural objectives in a row, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't too frustrating. And mm -hmm. so that notion of partial failure is a lesson I learned all the way as far back as, as the Thief series when I was working with uh, Randy Smith and co. I don't know if you've met him. Oh, yeah, um, we've, we've interviewed Randy, I think, on this stream before. I imagined you might, see? <laughs> I, I, I just guessed that because of GDC, et cetera. But, um, uh, you know, he talked a lot about the, the role of partial failure in, in games that even claim to support stealth, right? And even though ours is not uh, stealth only, um, that idea of, okay, the game is really fun and really scary when I'm almost screwed, but not entirely screwed. Can I pull it back up before the mountain? Can I recover the situation? And so there's a lot of, um, otherwise you get poor stealth, right? Where um, it's insta fail, uh, like yeah. a, lot of, a lot of action games that try to have the single stealth mission where you're, you just kind of feel like you've been slapped on the wrist by the hand of God. And, um, and then secondarily, there's also a narrative reason. The villain uh, who is taking this little fishbowl town of Red Acre, Virginia, where the, where the citizens can't get the word out of what, what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the villain values life, kind of, yeah. uh, and will do its utmost to try and preserve the bodies for purposes. Uh, uh, but if each individual kid is caught too many times, then they are deemed to be too large of a risk, and then it's curtains. Um, and so, I don't Which know Which is what is happening here. here. <laughs> what, yes. That's me, right there. We're watching me. And now we're watching my friends who are, the, the, my new friends who are trying to get us out. Right. Yes. But, and there's a, you know, just from a gameplay standpoint, you know, if you think about, like, I worked on the Borderlands, uh, the, the first Borderlands, and, like, the rescue mechanic, that last-ditch mechanic, you know, added a lot to the game when they finally put it in um, yeah and uh and sort of polished it up right like not just you know the demo version and uh the co-op like probably the you know hundreds of hours i spent testing that uh led to just kind of an innate assumption about cooperative play which is you know if you can't save your friend, you know, it's look at what they did in Gears of War as well, right? Like saving your friend is just a big part of the experience um, and reviving in general is a good part of like, we're in this together, we're gonna get this sorted. Um, and so a lot of really interesting things came about when we said, okay, your friend isn't dead, your friend is a sleepwalker, your friend has now become a dynamic challenge. Yeah. Um, the game changes, like the whole experience flips and suddenly, you know, you're, it's not over, and it's also now become a little bit more interesting. Um, yeah, and, and uh, you have a on chance that to note, be a hero. Exactly, exactly. On that note, um, that this genre that we're we're sort of trying to build the first major game version of um, the bond between the kids and and the sort of vicarious experience of kind of wanting to be one of those kids and having friendships that strong is, is a big part of the the thrill. Um, it's not just the horror. It's not just the the notion of them sort of using curse words for the first time at each other. Um, it's, uh, it's that, that, that notion that they're friends to the end, that they, that they would die for one another. And, and uh, that is in the, the deep DNA of this game. We really wanted you to feel like um, you were part of a group that uh, your friendship is all you have. 
Uh, and one of the things that's kind of funny about the Blackout Club is that we don't strictly enforce it. You can absolutely not just fail an objective, but as long as you've succeeded at one objective, you get some experience. Failure, failure sort of um, uh, teaches the club. But then on top of that, there's a bonus for leaving with everybody, um, everybody uh, not sleepwalking, everybody intact. And it's, but you can, you can go through hundreds of missions and level up your character without doing that. You can abandon your friends and it can be fine, but nobody does. We've watched so many people play this game on Twitch and so forth, and they always want to go back for each other, even when they're playing with randos, which we find deeply heartwarming, and it feels like the themes are working. Nice. Uh, well, as we're about to see, my my run here is about to wrap up. Um, my recorded footage is about to shut off for the day. Um, but yeah, uh, Jordan and Mike, I guess Patches. Can I call you Patches? Am I in hey, the Patches Club? Patches. Yeah, Jordan and Patches, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a really cool chat, and I'm really excited to see where development on the Blackout Club goes going forward. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah um, for the folks at home, uh, if you are uh, watching, if you are interested in more streams, we would love it if you hit the follow button because we're going to be talking to a lot of other great devs for the rest of the year into 2019 and as we get ready for GDC 2019. Um, brief disclosure, uh, this will be going up on Gama Sutra later today. Gama Sutra and, uh, Gama Sutra and GDC are owned by the same parent organization, which is now Informa. Um, uh, other than that, uh, if you are interested in going to GDC, I would like to recommend you scroll down and click the register button. We are, it, it's now, right now is the best time to register because these are the lowest prices, blah, blah, blah. Um, my bosses are not going to like hearing me say blah, 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 um, about <laughs> our darn show but yeah anyway um uh this is what we're all about we're trying to you know talk to game developers learn more about the art of game development share that information uh with the other game developers uh liz is a noob you just got here don't worry we're gonna archive this and put it on gamma sutra um the, the vod will go up on the twitch channel um we're gonna make sure you can watch it and uh you know see what you missed out on with that uh, is there, if they have any questions, uh, where should they ask you guys? I, I assume the Discord channel is a good place to go. Yeah, it's easy. Uh, just go to discord.gg uh, slash the blackout club, all one word. And, we also uh, can... yeah, are on Twitter at, at the blackout club. I'm at at null speak. Uh, we, tend, we tend to engage with Twitter quite a bit just because we get questions there that don't make it to Discord. Right and on. if you and if you just find the blackout club on Steam, uh, we try to be on the, on the discussions community hub. Uh, as well, although I'm I'm not as good at that as the Discord. Right on. With that, have a good day, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Thanks for having us.